we are going to begin our last section with our national speaker. Uh, our, our final speaker here today, Marcus Lingenfelter, has, has lived a life of service, whether serving the University of Virginia or in the United States Marine Corps. Uh, he, he's lived his life, uh, I think, the purpose for others. He uh, is here to talk to us today about how we can better align our educational systems uh, to promote STEM education and really transform, revitalize, and, and move our economy forward. You know, these ideas of what, what do teachers do, what are, why do students go to school, right? It's to, it's to become well-rounded, it is to build skills, to have experiences, and to have mindsets that will last them a lifetime, and it's also to prepare them for a, a changing 21st century workforce. So I'm really excited to, to be able to be here today and learn from Marcus Lingenfelter. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Levi. Oh, I need a, I need to meet me at a podium for that. Yeah. There should be a podium there. Let me see. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How about good afternoon? Sorry. <laughs> it's been one of those days. There we go. Thank you. As much TED talky as I could be, because as you notice, I. Uh, I still adopt a certain uniform dress code and I can't let go of the tie. I apologize, I'm not hip enough to wear black jeans or something and look very, very Silicon Valley-ish. Uh, but I wanna thank the governor and State Superintendent Baszler for inviting me. This is my sixth visit to North Dakota as well, by the way, so I think I, I matched Ted from earlier. I, when do we get our honorary North Dakotan status? <laughs> uh, I think you said toaster's at 10, but honorary status is at 20, right? In all honesty, we're very grateful to be partners with North Dakota. I met Superintendent Basler. it's been three and a half years, I think, now, and NIMSI has the good fortune, I had the good fortune to work with a lot of state leaders, and as you might imagine in your, in your dealings, not all professionals are equally as talented as all others, and I've been especially proud to work with Superintendent Basler and her vision for what to do better for the students and the citizens in North Dakota. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm here to give you a bit of a good news story. The presenters earlier were fantastic. Who thought they were fantastic? You know, this is, this is a first class education conference here, up until right now, by the way. Uh, this has been a first class education conference right here at home, and I think the organizers did a fantastic job. But the, the story I wanna share with you is about something that's underway right now in your own state. So I hope that you will take away from this some inspiration because we are here to help you do the best job that you can as educators and communities to help your students and to advance the economy and the life of North Dakotans. And that's what we're here for, and I, I hope to be able to give you that, that story. Um, so, international rankings were mentioned before, and there's a lot of discussion about the U.S. standing in the way of math and science. But I was on a panel once in San Antonio, and they played a clip of a news broadcaster, an anchor person, and on air, the anchor person said, well, I'm not good at math. I just can't do that. On air, made that admission. So think to yourself in a dinner gathering or some group of professionals, if you said, well, I'm illiterate. I'm simply illiterate. I'm just, that, that writing and reading stuff, I'm just not good at that. <laughs> Why is it okay, professionally, for that news reporter, or frankly anyone, to say and to admit and then to just freely say, I'm not good at that math and sciencey stuff? At what point do we shift the conversation? Okay, we've achieved terif terrific rates of literacy in this country. Next is STEM literacy. The children under our care right now cannot survive in this economy without having basic STEM literacy. So we need to change the conversation. It needs to be unacceptable to say, oh, why that math and science stuff, I can't do that. Think about that the next time you're with a group of people and somebody mentions something like that. When did that become acceptable and how do we stamp that out? 
STEM literacy is not just about rankings for the, the world, but for the country. This country has led the way with innovation. From Ben Franklin, Thomas Edison, to the Gates and Jobs of today, we enjoy the standard of living and the nation's strongest economy because of the innovations that were hatched right here. And they all go back to having that STEM literacy, that STEM workforce to drive forth those innovations. Whether it was at Bell Labs in New Jersey or now in Silicon Valley or wherever, all of the innovation that has given us the life that we enjoy in America comes from STEM literacy. And let me give you some, uh, maybe a more fine point on this. There's a lot of global competition for our scientists and engineers. As you might imagine, we've done a fairly nice job of producing these scientists and engineers. And France and Canada are already saying, hey, NIH funding going to go down? Come to us. Come to Paris. Do your research here. Create your innovations in our neck of the woods. We'll make things better for you. So we are under threat of losing the scientists and engineers we already have. And then there's the ones, the next generation that we need. You know, half of all high schools in the United States are considered by NIMSI to be STEM deserts. They are devoid of rigorous math and science. Half of all high school. What are we doing as an organization to help correct that problem? But if we sit idly by and do nothing, what happens? Our kids don't get the STEM literacy that we think they need. What are the consequences? Maybe our diminished economy, maybe we don't have the next set of technological innovations. Well, last week I was in Huntsville, Alabama. Anybody been to Huntsville? Huntsville is the home of American rocket and missile technology. Warner von Braun was brought from Germany, was settled in Huntsville, and since that day and every day since, that is the epicenter of all missile and rocket technology in this country. From the space program to the Department of Defense application of that technology, it all is centered in Huntsville, Alabama. And by the way, when you get off the airplane in the airport, there's no way you can not understand that because of all the visuals you see in the airport. Who saw the news report last week of an American missile intercept system that shot down a mock ICBM? Everybody see that? It's a pretty big deal. That is our message to other countries. We are not afraid of whatever it is you're doing or think you can do because our technology is superior and we here in North America are safe. All the technology behind that test comes from Huntsville, Alabama. All 13 high schools serving the Huntsville, Alabama community, all NIMSI schools. And the three-star general who did that test and was responsible for that, he was a very happy camper last week, as you might imagine. You just imagine what his mood would have been if it had gone wrong. <laughs> Our stakeholders are terrified. NIMSI's stakeholders, whether they be government or corporations, they are terrified. Why are they terrified? Because the baby boomers are retiring. All of these scientists and engineers, and frankly, in your own world, science and math educators are retiring in mass. The cliff is upon us. So not to mention the need to grow our economy and build out the innovations of the future, we are now trying to catch up with the backlog to replace all the folks who are leaving us. And that lack of talent will hold us back. I grew up in an anthracite coal town in northeast Pennsylvania. It is not a very nice place today. It is a recognition of that technology is lost and the town didn't move forward. The education in that community did not move forward and the economic opportunities are just not there. But the STEM needs are contextual. It's very localized. A lot of talk today about local. You see how you're colored in up there in North Dakota being one of the highest states in terms of need for STEM jobs. But the STEM jobs that are needed here are very different than needed someplace else. Agriculture, technology, energy, these are your tech jobs. 
Well, how about down in Florida, along the Space Coast? The commercial and government-sponsored space industry, they need those workers. Aerospace in California. Cyber. You'll hear from a gentleman from Microsoft Teals later on. The need to train our students in computer coding is almost unprecedented. And the threats to our national security on cyber relate to that. So STEM literacy, my point here, STEM literacy is like written literacy has been for the last 100 years, 200 years. It is a non-negotiable, we must have it for our kids. You're gonna hear me talk a lot about advanced placement. Advanced placement is, it's been around since the 50s. University recognized for its rigor, a third party valid and reliable assessment of student learning. But it goes beyond just getting college credit at an institution of higher learning. It is an evidence point that students have achieved mastery of content and skills. And it's not just the education world that thinks so. This is from the US Chamber of Commerce. U.S. Chamber of Commerce obviously is very invested in building the workforce of the 21st century, helping states and companies make decisions. They guide states, or guide companies rather, by sharing with them the level of production of AP STEM qualifying scores. That's a grade three, four, and five on the assessment. On the number of graduates walking out of their high schools with AP STEM under their belt. Why? It's a proxy for STEM workforce. Look at those states at the top. Massachusetts, Maryland, Connecticut, Virginia, New York, New Jersey. What do they all have in common? They are all extremely STEM intensive economies, every single one of them. This is seen by the business community as a measurement to be concerned about whether to locate in a jurisdiction, whether it has the workforce they need. The Department of Defense also makes that same determination. There are a couple million dependents of military families stationed all over the world. 90% of them are in US public schools. They are not in Department of Defense run schools. They are in our schools. Anybody from Minot or Grand Forks here? Hoorah. <laughs> they are in our schools. And Department of Defense has partnered with us now for seven years, deploying $100 million to put us and our work into the public schools that service their service members to make sure that those children of our US service members do not take a hit, are not disadvantaged because their parents stood up and took the oath. And lastly, we use the AP framework and measurement because it helps us as a proxy for how well our schools are doing. So I wanted to give you that context because we're gonna talk a lot about AP. 10 years ago, National leaders got together and realized that this cliff was upon us. This is from the National Academies, the Rise Above the Gathering Storm Report. One of the recommendations was stop funding programs that do not have an evidence base and do not have measurable outcomes. An evidence base and measurable outcomes. There are a lot of programs that feel good, look good, they make you smile, but where is the beef? Remember that one? Where's the beef? This report is what called for our creation. Created as a nonprofit to replicate programs with evidence and that can be scaled. That's the other piece. There's an evidence base, there's measurement, and there's the ability to scale. There are a lot of great programs out there that are in a small community here or there, but can they be scaled on a national level? Our friends at ExxonMobil who, as you might imagine, have a certain interest in having scientists and engineers being grown in great numbers here in this country. ExxonMobil stepped forth with $125 million as their initial gift. Since then, they've contributed an additional $60 million. All in, we're at roughly half a billion dollars of public and private investment to advance this mission to address the STEM workforce crisis in America. But one of my favorite stories, because it's not all large dollar funders. We've got school districts are paying for themselves. New York City funds 200 schools across all five boroughs. Smaller school districts are funding 
But my favorite story about our funders, copper miners, pecan farmers, and senior citizens' homes. Check that, senior citizens' homes are funding schools in Salarita, Arizona, just south of Tucson. Anybody here ever think of a, a senior citizens' home funding education before? It's not, a, it's not a very common thing. These are our three programs. I'm gonna talk about two of them because two of them are already deployed here in North Dakota. The third we're gonna to get to. We do work at the university level of how your teachers are trained in pre-service, but the bulk of our work is in K-12. And all of our work is focused on the teacher. Nothing happens without the teacher. Laying the foundation, as you might imagine, given its name, this is teacher training, model lessons, instructional strategies, helping teachers from elementary through high school, not advanced placement, all teachers, giving them the tools they need to make their students as successful as possible. This program has been running now in North Dakota since 2015. Do we have any teachers here who have actually been to LTF training? I can't see very well. I see a few hands out there. This is the foundation of it all. And whether students go on to advanced placement work or not, this training in the schools will get results. Eighth and 10th grade math and ELA scores on ACT assessments improve because of this training. But the college readiness program, anybody remember, or let me ask you this way, who knows about CERN over in Switzerland? Everybody heard of CERN, right? They split the atom over there. Who knew that was supposed to be in Texas? The super colliding superconductor in Waxahachie, Texas. That is what gave birth to this program. Business leaders, philanthropists, educators got together and said, we do not have the STEM workforce in this community that will drive that kind of project, and we do not have the schools where the engineers and scientists will want to put their, their children in these, in these schools. So they took a former corporate actuary turned AP calculus teacher in inner city Dallas. It's a circuitous route to become a teacher. And they built out a program that started 25 years ago. Started in nine schools, as of this fall will be in 1,200 schools in 34 states. And all because they recognized, you know, we can do better for our kids. We can change things, adjust the rules, not make time, seat time the, the driver, but make mastery the driver. What can we do differently about the way we deliver instruction? What can we do differently about the, the supports we give students? The College Readiness Program is doing three things. Building instructional capacity and effectiveness in the school building, both high school and the feeders. Math, science, and English. The joke is with English, one of our founders is Norm Augustine. He was, a, he was the, the chairman of the report. He's also the CEO and chairman of Lockheed Martin. Uh, he likes to, to muse that he's met far too many engineers who did not know how to communicate effectively and that we had to make sure English stayed part of the program. Build instructional capacity, grades three to 12, math, science, and English. Change the culture around who gets to access rigorous coursework. You know, I get to go to school systems all over the country, and one of the worst statements I've ever heard, and I, I, it pains me every time I still hear it, you know, my kids, they just can't do that stuff. If the educators don't believe that the kids can do it, how in the world are the kids gonna believe they can do it? And our program works to address that issue specifically. When I was younger, the, in high school, we had something called the audio-visual club. Anybody remember the AV club, right? And you had a certain stereotype in your mind about the audio-visual club. But then around the same time I was in high school, the movie The Breakfast Club came out. And I like to say, we're, we're switching it up that AP Physics is not just for the AV club, it's for the breakfast club. We want all students standing up there with their AP qualifying scores. Every subset of high school life, every demographic you can think of, 
because AP rigorous coursework is for all kids, not just some kids. And we work hard over three year implementation to change the culture of a school. And some don't need that change. Some are already embracing of that. They just need the extra supports and the training. But sadly, more often than not, it is the adults who are withholding access for various reasons that their kids never get to see those, those courses. And lastly, is measurable outcomes. So we're looking for instructional capacity, change the culture around who gets to access courses, and then measurable outcomes. AP, you are in a five in AP physics in Ocean Springs, Mississippi, is the same as Boston Latin or some suburban rich high school in California. And that's what we're looking for, measurable outcomes. And these are our outcomes. First year in the door, average increase above baseline is 71%. Clearly, the students can do it. Otherwise, that number would be a lot lower. It's not that we've got some sort of magic sauce or we have teachers that are, that are on a se some secret island. We bring them off, fly them in to do some amazing things. The students can do it. They just need the support. And the teachers need a little extra help to understand how to get at those other kids. Three years. It's a three-year implementation. Average increase. Qualifying scores. That's three, fours, and fives in AP math and, physics, math and science is 152%. This is the reason the Department of Defense invests so much money in this program. It is these kinds of results. That middle bar there, students of color, US Department of Education has recently charged us vis-a-vis -a, -vis a grant, Detroit, St. Louis, Cleveland, Houston, Oakland, Atlanta. These are not garden parties. These are tough places. But we're in there. And we're, the educators are so excited because they've never seen supports like this. And they've never had those conversations of, yes, my kids can do this too. This is what we're all about, is producing these kinds of results for our school partners, with our school partners, and for those who help pay for this. One of our favorite stories, Mississippi. Mississippi regrettably still sits on the bottom of just about every education ranking. We brought this program with a grant from the Navy down to on the Gulf Coast. Their baseline before we got there was seven qualifying scores in math and science, just seven. And it's an average size high school, 15, 1800 kids. Their qualifying scores in their third year were 154. It has transformed that whole school system Hundreds of families have since moved in. The mayor of Ocean Springs wants to put this on the website to be the top performing NIMSI school ever. The school and the students were recognized at the White House. One of the students got to introduce the second lady of the United States. It has completely changed the game, not just for one school, but all of for the neighboring school systems who are all saying, how do we do that? How do we do that for our kids? The parents are asking the same question. Why aren't you doing what Ocean Springs is doing and how can we do that? This is the kind of transformation that we're talking about. And it shows what's possible. Let me go back one second. It shows what's possible when you deliver. And this isn't just for one community. This is for the country. Stennis Space Center is right next door. All rockets, before they go on a vehicle, are tested at Stennis. Stennis has problems hiring scientists and engineers to come to that location because of some of the reputation issues. This solves not just a problem or a challenge for a school system, but it solves a problem for a community and for the country. Alabama. Our friends at ExxonMobil have been extraordinarily generous. Nearly $200 million, I would say, is extraordinarily generous in, in the world of education philanthropy. And they have funded statewide replication efforts in multiple jurisdictions. Alabama, Arkansas, Connecticut, Kentucky, Massachusetts, and Virginia were all the original states that we partnered with. The US Department of Education 
deployed us to Colorado and Indiana. But most recently, Exxon has said, we want you to focus on Louisiana, Pennsylvania, and? Come on, we can do better than that. And? And North Dakota. We were very excited about this because State Superintendent Basler and I had already been talking before this came about, and this just seemed like the perfect opportunity to really make some magic happen. Alabama I use as an example for a couple of reasons. In this case, in 2008, before Alabama started implementation, they were ranked one notch above North Dakota in terms of the production of math science qualifying scores per thousand students. They're basically peers. In 2015, they were no longer peers. North Dakota went down one notch, and Alabama went up 18 notches. How did that happen? Well, it was leadership. Those of you who are building leaders and district leaders know leadership matters. Who you put in charge of a building or a district matters. It was the resources, not just $13.2 million from ExxonMobil, but Companies match those resources now five times over, including, as of this year, the state invests $6.6 million per year in this work. 6.6. And why? Because it pays off. Investment in, results out. Measurable outcomes for their investment. But also because they were hungry. They wanted to pick up off the bottom of that ranking. They knew they needed a STEM workforce, not just in Huntsville, they needed it in Birmingham, in Mobile, they needed it all over the state to address different needs. So with leadership, resources, and a hunger that some of the other members spoke about earlier, and I agree, this is my sixth trip. I love coming to North Dakota because there is a sense of optimism and a we can get this done that does not exist in every other state. So it's very refreshing. But this is what I predict will be North Dakota in four or five years. They have led the country for improvements for the last eight years. I think North Dakota is probably going to unseat them possibly this year. If not this year, then definitely next. And it's all largely because of the investment that was made. The investment was made. The resources are here. The tools are here. And now it's just about giving the educators the tools they need, the extra time they need, giving the students the extra time they need, giving the educators the mentoring they need. A program built by teachers for teachers to be deployed to benefit students and ultimately to benefit us all with a dramatically improved output of students coming out with qualifying scores in the most rigorous math science examinations to date. Even though this program's been around for 25 years, we're making innovations as well. I saw a number of hands go up earlier about the rural, from rural communities, and you're probably sitting there wondering, well, that sounds great, Marcus, but we don't have a physics teacher, we don't have a computer science teacher, we don't have a calculus teacher, and we're not likely to be able to attract one anytime soon, so what are you gonna do for me? Well, we have an answer. In 2008, Exxon funded a pilot of this program in South Dakota, your neighbors. It went extremely well. We're now updating the technology to deploy this program across North Dakota starting in 2018, 2019. So that not just the larger school systems that gets this, get this program on a bricks and mortar basis, but all school systems, regardless of their size, will be able to do this work and be able to offer these resources to their kids and to their teachers. That's in, that's in the works. The, the other one that's in the works, do we have anyone here from a BIE or tribally run school? Okay, it's very difficult to see, so I can't see quite well. We have been in conversation with the National Indian Education Association for the last year and a half, and we are on the crux of a full-blown national partnership to bring this work to school systems that service American Indian, Alaskan Native students. We have a three school pilot going on 
in Colorado right now for the Ute Mountain Ute and Southern Ute tribes. And we expect the results of that to inform next steps. We also expect them to be good. But we want to make this not just good, we want to make it right. We want to make it perfect. And this is a place here in North Dakota where I think we can have another measurable impact. Serving your military dependents at Minot and Grand Forks, serving your American Indian and Alaskan Native students all over the state, serving all of your larger school systems, and through blended delivery, serving every school system that wants to do this work nationwide, or statewide, rather. What's, our, what's in the future for us? What's next? We need to greater contextualize the STEM learning to the communities where it's being deployed. We've got some ways to do that. One we piloted this year, it's called a STEM mentoring exchange. And it happened because a PhD in chemical engineering woman, who also happens to be a four-star general in the Air Force, sat with a group of students in a high school building from 1936 just to prove the point, you don't need this kind of structure to do this good work. She sat with these students along with some Northrop Grumman engineers. They were female students in AP Computer Science and AP Physics, talking with them about their career options. They didn't know that Los Angeles Air Force Base was right up the road. They didn't know that the aerospace sector was in El Segundo, right up the road. They don't have to leave their communities. They just need to do well on these courses in high school stay local for college, and have a prosperous career in the aerospace and IT world right there in Los Angeles. We did one in Utah, Davis County, Utah, just north of Salt Lake, had two dozen engineers sitting with 100 students talk about their career options, trying to contextualize what does AP mean for them going forward. Ironically, every single one of those engineers had taken AP when they were in high school. And more recently, and more poignantly, Augusta, Georgia, cyber. There are 10,000 computer science jobs going to Augusta, Georgia. They do not presently have the capabilities to build that workforce. They need the help. Their first NIMSI site produced a 300% increase in math and science over two years. We're now deploying four more sites to that location to serve that need. But when we brought in some folks from Booz Allen Hamilton to talk to the students, they were very enlightening about what is necessary to have a career in computer science. And the students were incredibly engaged. And one of the teachers said to me, I just said that same thing to that student just on yesterday in class. And he didn't listen to me. But this guy says it who he doesn't know. And all of a sudden, it's gospel. I suspect that's a familiar theme. But not just the students need contextualization the educators do. There's a program in Iowa where educators get to go for the summer and embed themselves with industry to learn and modernize. Most educators, I suspect, go directly from college to the workforce as a teacher and don't ever enter, enter industry. So how are they supposed to know what industry actually needs? How does it look on the other side of the fence? Deploying teachers through some kind of fellowship program like that to get them the contextual understanding they need. The folks at Teals, the Microsoft Teals program, rolling out computer science, another national priority, they're helping with that very issue. Deploying Microsoft computer scientists and other computer scientists into those classrooms to help those teachers understand not just the content of how to teach it, but how it applies. We as an organization, as a nonprofit charged with improving math science outcomes for the country, we are hyper focused on results for our partners, our school partners and our funding partners, and all to serve a national mission of improving the math science workforce pipeline for this country. We are extraordinarily proud to be here in North Dakota. We will be here and with you in North Dakota for at least the next five to seven years. So I will get my toaster eventually. Kirsten's tried to make me move to Bismarck. Uh, hasn't quite set yet, but she'll probably keep trying. 
But this is what we're here to do for you. We're not here to tell you that there's a right way or wrong way. We're here to give you, the educators, the supports and the resources you need to better serve your students and ultimately better serve the state and the nation. I thank you for your attention. And I think we're going to have a dynamic panel come out and share their perspectives about this STEM workforce crisis and how do we help deliver on that need. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. All right, we are now going to um, begin our, our last panel dis discussion here of the day. We are pleased to jo be joined um, by Dr. Tamara Uselman, Superintendent of Bismarck Public Schools. Thank you for joining us, Tamara. We are also joined by Greg Pulliam, uh, representing XTO Energy today. Greg, thanks so much for being here. Greg Teschner of Mi the Microsoft Teals program, thank you for joining us. Dale Horoff of the, uh, the Career and Technical Education Director for Bismarck Public Schools. And last but certainly not least, a student here uh, in Bismarck, Max Ridequist. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Do you want me to yeah. Okay. Uh, Tamara, you have had this program in two of your schools now for a year, and you've sent teachers off to training. And just to give a superintendent's perspective, not coached, what is your experience thus far with this program? So our, ex our experience with the program has been pretty positive. I'll just use a quote from one of my teachers. I think that is who we need to listen to as our teachers, was Ryan Bleth, who teaches here in this building. And uh, I would be comfortable saying Ryan Bleth is one of those rock star teachers before he went, quite frankly. But when Ryan Bleth comes back and says, this is the best uh, training I've ever had as a teacher, uh, I'm surprised at how much I learned and how much I grew. I wasn't even aware uh, of what was out there. I think that's a pretty strong statement about the quality of the NIMSI training that our teachers got. Terrific. Um, we have two Gregs, by the way. We have Teal's Greg and we have XTO Greg. Uh, Greg. Tell me about the uh, computer science uh, aspect here. The nation is sort of fixated on computer science as a national need. And what is it Teals is doing differently to help deliver on this mission? So Teals uh, stands for Technology, Education, and Literacy in Schools. Uh, it's a, a grassroots program developed by a Microsoft engineer. It's, uh, we do three things, uh, three reasons we think computer science belongs in high schools. One is the workforce development piece. You guys have heard about that today. Uh, our data shows that about 71% of the new jobs in the next five years are going to be in computing, yet only about 8% of those uh, graduates are going to be in computer science. We provide uh, three things. We provide curriculum. Uh, real legit curriculum, it comes from uh, Cal Berkeley, Beauty and Joy of Computing, that's our intro to computer science class. We provide CSA curriculum from the University of Washington and we support a number of people's computer science principles curriculum. The, the other reasons that uh, computer science is important are for three reasons. One is for workforce development. Uh, obviously Microsoft has a a selfish need for that. We need programmers and they aren't there. Second is for informed citizens. You guys all heard uh, Marcus talk about Benjamin Franklin, for example. Well, Benjamin Franklin invented the post office, for those of you who don't know that, and it wasn't to deliver your Amazon packages. <laughs> it was actually to deliver newspapers. So that uh, a working democracy requires informed citizens and in this day and age, which uh, you've all heard all day long that uh, we're in the middle of a digital transformation, autonomous ve vehicles are coming. In fact, uh, the first ones are here in North Dakota, the combines driving around the fields, some of them without drivers in them. And so informed citizens is a second piece. And the third piece is the computational thinking piece. Part of that digital transformation is in all industries. We don't just need programmers at Microsoft or at Amazon or at Uber 
We need them everywhere. They're in healthcare. Mm -hmm. They are in the finance industry. As we just talked about, they're in agriculture. Fargo has two John Deere facilities, and what do you think they're doing there? They're programming those combines. So that, that's the reason Microsoft is passionate about it. The, and just to pile on the North Dakota thing, uh, Brad Smith is the president of Microsoft, the number two guy there, and he is pushing computer science very hard in five states. And they are Virginia, Wisconsin, Wyoming, Michigan, and? That's the, and that's the reason we're here. Thank you. Hey, Max, I want to, to jump off of uh, something Greg said. Uh, you uh, got to know Max in, in the back, and uh, it should be noted that he has uh, not just uh, graduated from this high school and has started a company, but he has also taken the oath and joined the United States Army. So is the very few 1%. Thank you. And I think that shows there's not one character type uh, uh, that, that if you join the service, you can't do something else. Uh, so he has a, a company called Dragon Drones. And I want you to talk, Max, about the contextual aspect of learning, because it sounds like you've had some very deliberate experiences that have informed your choices. Uh, yes, I have. Um, to talk a lot uh, going into the STEM uh, kind of curriculum when it comes to the Career Academy, which is actually up at BSC here, uh, I took our first year aviation class, our second year, and I started a third year, as well as a capstone program in that. Um, so in our aviation class, uh, we have the opportunity to kind of work at our own pace and know exactly what we want to do. Uh, this gives us an opportunity to work with different, excuse me, different types of technology, uh, and a lot of the things that we find, you know, interesting uh, in our day and age for our generation. So uh, I got the opportunity to not only sit down in class and learn what I wanted to learn, uh, but had many opportunities to work on the drone industry, which is where I'm fancied in, uh, as well as an internship out at Exec. Um, working with all of those uh, gives me the opportunity to really be able to see what I want to do, what I can be good at, and what I can provide to and for everybody else. So to start out, our Aviation One is actually just teaching us first-year aviation. Uh, our second year, a new teacher jumped in and really promoted our STEM research there. Uh, his name was Brad Sting. Um, what he did for us was allowing us to really work at our own pace, really work on what we wanted to. So currently at the Career Academy, we're actually building a full-size aircraft, an RV-12 in the back. Uh, there, actually, I kind of stepped up and became kind of our engineer there and have been putting the airplane together since. Uh, along with working on this aircraft, he allowed me to work on the drones that we had just obtained. Uh, working with these drones gave me kind of insight on how I wanted to you know, really go about life. Because I wasn't sure if I wanted to be a pilot or if I wanted to go into the drone industry. Uh, well, after going through my internship, uh, I realized, you know, drones are more of my thing. Uh, this, in reality, is going to save me about $250,000 in four years of my life that I would have <laughs> probably have spent <laughs> where I didn't want to go. So, thank you. So, uh, along with that, uh, with that experience, I got to do a whole lot of things through that internship. Uh, I mean, I did everything at this internship, from working with security cameras to fueling airplanes to taking apart full-size engines and repairing helicopters. Uh, you name it, I've done just about everything. I mean, even cleaning the bathrooms, it's just part of the internship. So I have done just about everything there. Uh, with that insight, it allowed me to really sit down and realize, you know, this is how I want to run my business. Uh, this is what I think I can do with that. Uh, and these are the kind of opportunities that I've been given. And I'm using them at what I what I see is fully available for me at this time. So uh, the STEM has really given me, and a lot of my colleagues at school, the opportunity to really be able to sit back and say, guys, this is what we have for an opportunity. Uh, you guys need to really sit down and, and think about this, and, and we can do a lot with these opportunities. Uh, so my classmates are all interested in what I'm doing, and they're interested in how the Career Academy is furthering that. So thank you. Max, I can tell you that uh, if you hadn't already learned how to clean that bathroom, the Army would have taught you. <laughs> Now, uh, <laughs> Dale, my, my aunt and uncle worked their entire careers at, at a Votech school. Uh, and it's not your grandpa's CTE anymore. What, uh, what's been the, the two biggest changes in your mind over your career of, of how things are viewed today versus when you first started? Well, I think Max is prime, prime example. You know, I think in the old days, and I am from the old days, it's if you couldn't do anything else, we don't know what we're going to do with you. If you're not behaving well in school, 
we'll send you to the Votech. <laughs> <laughs> because you're not going to go to college, and uh, you're good with your hands, and we need people to work on greasy things. And, you know, and that's sad. And so I think where we've come around, and we've come completely around, where everybody needs to know the same skills, whether, it's, whether you're working on combines, and I agree 100%. I mean, they drive themselves. Or, or an example like Max, he came, he came to us not knowing what to do. We allow students to explore, and I think that's the real key. You allow them to explore, and once they explore, and if this is something they're really interested in, then let's try to take them through those next levels. And so that means how do we integrate the math? How do we in integrate the science? I mean, again, Max is a, a good example in that how does an airplane fly? You know, you need to know the basics of math and science to do that. So I think that's the real turnaround that's, that's happened in career and technical education. And so it's not just for anybody, it's for everybody. <laughs> and so I think that's the difference. And, uh, and then the articulation agreements, the dual credit arrangements we have in our case with Bismarck State College. So again, if it's something, if you do not like smoke going in your eyes, well fine, do something else. It, and then maybe you're not gonna be a welder or you're gonna faint when you see the sight of blood. Maybe med careers is not for you. <laughs> The good part is, if it is for you, then we're going to take you to that next level. And one, one note that worth making, I often engage in conversations, people say, well, AP and CTE, those are two different universes, and never the two shall collide. And that's not true at all. Some of the best CTEs in this country offer advanced placement as part of their offerings to have that full suite. Greg, you, uh, uh, I might have mentioned your employer once or twice uh, during my comments, but from the energy sector, why is this important? Is, is that cliff as, as steep and as dramatic as I portrayed it to be? Well, th first of all, I want to thanks, thank the governor's office for inviting us. It's an honor to be here. Um, some people in the, uh, first of all, I'll clarify, XTO is a wholly owned subsidiary of ExxonMobil. The Bakken shale formation is amongst our most important assets in the United States. It's a high priority state. Some of you all might, out there might be asking, why is an oil company guy sitting up here on, you know, in a, topic of uh, innovation and education, well, let me tell you and show you why. I have a few facts to share with you. In just 2016 alone, my company, ExxonMobil, spent $72 million on education initiatives. $50 million of that comes from a pretty unique program that I'm not sure another company has in this country. We have a three-to-one education match. So I give a dollar to my undergraduate alma mater, Oregon. Exxon gives them $3. So that total just last year came to $50 million. Our company spends a billion dollars a year on research and development. That's a billion dollars a year. We employ, we, we employ over 30,000 engineers and scientists. And I think it's upward, it's between one and 2,000 PhDs in that number. Our company's driven by the creation and implementation of innovative technologies. So over the next decade, and, and I, mean, I mean, we see the data, right? We see the, we see the writing on the wall, which is why we uh, helped start the National Math and Science Initiative. It's not purely philanthropic. I mean, it serves our interests. You know, the data says there's, over, there's est estimated to be over a million STEM jobs that will go unfilled over the next decade. People will not have the competencies to fill those jobs. STEM jobs are... I think clearly I'm painting the picture, the lifeblood of my company. So the, just for the last bit, so we, in 2007 we gave 125 million to National Math and Science. We, I believe, gave another 60 at some point after that. Uh, it, it was, when I originally talked to the corporation about including North Dakota and I talked to, talked to Kirsten Baszler, who you all should feel very lucky to have in North Dakota. I deal with a lot of education leaders around the country. Uh, I don't think I've met one that is so sincerely committed to improving education in the state. Um, so give her a round of applause, yeah. everybody. Here, here. And I'll just, I'll, I'll end on this. When I first met Kirsten, she asked me a question. She said, why, why is education so important to your company? I'm just, I'm sure we have a talking point to answer that question, but uh, I didn't know what it was. And I just knee-jerkly said, it is the lifeblood of who we are. I later thought about that, and um, it came to, you, you know, it hit me that it's not the lifeblood of ExxonMobil, it's the lifeblood of our communities. It's the lifeblood of our, of our country. Uh, and, and we're a global country. 
I mean, we're, sorry, we're a global company. So we see the need for this all over the world. So thank you very much. I'm going to give the last word. Thank you, Greg, and thank you. Uh, we would not be here if not for Exxon's generosity. Um, Tamara, I'm going to give you the last word as, as superintendent, and we're in your building. Um, you and I met when we sat with Governor Dalrymple around that table, and you first heard about all this. Um, any uh, reflections as to has this gone on course as expected, or has it taken some twists and turns, and if we could do, go back and do something differently, what could we do? So it's always good to get the last word. And I want to say thank you to everybody who came today and hung out. The energy in the room when we talk about innovating is uh, uplifting. And so I just, uh, I kind of needed that charge, actually. <laughs> when we sat around and talked with Governor Dalrymple early on when we were talking about NIMSI, to me, I was deeply intrigued because of, because uh, here's my why. And I think Greg said it best on the end. We have a democracy here. You see the issues playing out today um, about a democracy and what a democracy means. And regardless of how all that settles out, I believe our work as educators is to save a democracy. It's a constant experiment. So in my school, when we believe so strongly that each child has to have a fair chance in that democracy, we come from this position of love and social justice, if you will. And if you know your why, and you have the courage to live your why, then you start looking for tools. What tools help you live your why? And so we have some. We believe strongly that teachers have to have voice and choice in this. They have to work collaboratively. That makes sense to us. We believe education has to be inquiry-based all the time. Hmm. So project-based learning makes sense to us. Uh, we truly believe that kids are the best human beings they know how to be. And when we get them, then we, we work from multi-tiered systems of support on the academic side uh, to, to bring them up, skill them up, but also from the self-regulation side about how to learn about their behavior, what is their behavior telling us, how do we put in those, those corrections for kids. And so those are just um, three of what we call our five big rocks. And then we use data to help inform us. And if you work from the lens of love, you don't only take qualitative feedback like Ryan Bleth gave. That's important to me, what my teachers think. But quantitative matters too. And I would argue with anybody who says you don't need standards in a school. You absolutely need standards. But you can be whimsical and creative in your design with them. So we run a standard-based system. But data informs us about our decisions. And to get back to the, the point you asked me, uh, when you asked if I wanted the last word, I gave more than that. But um, the data that we feel we're going to get back from investing in NIMSI is going to be a true payoff for our kids. And that's why. I mean, I don't come to school to create workers for the world. I think kids need to be choice ready uh, to choose what they want to do for college, to go uh, into whatever career they want to choose. But I really believe strongly our work is to protect a democracy. And so we have to raise these community-minded kids. But data is not separate from that. And so that data informs us. And I think it's been profound training, and it happens to match with what our five big rocks are. So thank you for bringing it to North Dakota, and thank you for getting it into the hands of our teachers, because that changes outcomes for our kids. And when we change outcomes for kids, we really make a better, stronger country. Agreed. So thank you. And we'll be back in the fall to celebrate your kids. Let's do that. <laughs> Levi, thank you so much. You've done a fantastic job, by the way, thank subbing you. in for the governor. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> he leaves big shoes to fill. <laughs> Thank you. Well, let's give it up one more time for Marcus and all of our panelists. Thank you so much. <laughs>